Uh, just wanted to welcome everybody. I think we're just going to relax, have like a great evening of uh, conversation. Um, just want to start by um, saying that for me, it's quite an honor to be part of all this amazingness during this pandemic. Uh, I think we are at the forefront of like setting new grounds as South Africa right now and as Africa as a continent within uh, fashion um, industry globally. Uh, but I would like to start with you, Amanda. Can you introduce yourself and, and explain uh, you from what you're asking? Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, it's a real privilege to be asked to discuss this. And I think it's such an interesting, um, a live conversation that needs to be talked about because to me, there is a seriously um, incredible emerging South African fashion aesthetic. And obviously it's very layered because all the different designers would come from um, their sort of life experience and their aesthetic interests and their preferences on fabric and color and, and what their inspiration is. But um, I think in the last, uh, say, year to two years, I can say that there is a, a genuine emerging essence of South African fashion. Um, I've really appreciated um, being able to explore that over the years and, and had an incredible interest in the diverse cultures that we have in our country. Born in Cape Town, um, my dad was a racehorse trainer and I was exposed to a, a, a variety of people who worked with him from different parts of the country and uh, was viscerally, viscerally struck by the adornings that the different cultures would hold on to or wear um, from a very young age. And so um, when I chose fashion, over um, my first choice of acting and theater and drama, and my second choice of art, finding both of those uh, not as uh, secure in terms of a choice for a career, and went with fashion, I was very interested to explore those other two elements in my work. And so um, being interested in culture, and living and having been born in South Africa, I mean, this is one of the things I have to be conscious of is that um, um, you can't control where you're born. So even though I'm a white person, um, I was born in South Africa. So the culture of um, the, 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 the upbringing and the clothing and the exposure is um, something that um, I wasn't in control of, but I loved. And so I wanted always in my work to deal with culture in a way that's hugely respectful. And I know we have this conversation coming up about appropriation or inspiration, but it has always been my intention to esteem the beauty of culture and not to um, take it on as my own, to always acknowledge where the initial inspiration came from. So I know one of the things we discussed was my use of Sishreshri, which I still love to this day. <laughs> Sorry, um, Philippe, we can't hear you. I don't know if anybody else can hear you. We, did anybody else hear what Philippe said? No, it didn't. I can't. A little bit. Hear me now. That sounds better. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Better. Uh, oh, I'm saying it's supposed to make it now. Uh, you're using a structured love card. Did you get that question, Amanda? No, um, I didn't hear your question. How did the function with your stress art? Still didn't get it. <laughs> Maybe type it in the in the comments. Uh, you can already hear me. 
But I think it may yeah. be, maybe someone else can, um, some one of the other panelists can can contribute to that question. I don't want to hold the floor. Yeah, because it's all very quiet, you know. Technology. Can you hear me? That sounds better. Um, is that better? Yes. Much better or just better? Much better. Much better. Okay. I was just in terms of situation. How did that love affair start? How, how did that love affair start? Yeah. Okay. Um, it was from when I was at Tech um, and um, studying um, in Durban and going down, we, the, the campus was pretty close to Gray Street and to get fabrics and trims and all our haberdashery, we would go down to Gray Street and I was exposed to um, the amazing stores that only sell, sold Sishweshwe and you'd go in and you'd be um, confronted with that smell and the, the visual of those bolts, those narrow fabric bolts stacked up against the walls and you know, just even um, you know, seeing dresses that were made in it and the beauty of those and it was intriguing for me to explore this, the history of Shui Shui. Okay, I'm just, I moved to Trevor. Your history is from Kimberley. I mean, I remember very well how you and especially with Teve, how that it is the maze that we see of people and was called you guys to be a new guard of 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 units of fashion. Um I didn't get the question. The line is awful. Could, could you is it awful? It? Yeah, I can hear you now. Is it, fun? Is it bad? Yeah, if you could kindly just repeat again. Okay, I'm saying, uh, especially with um, Kimberly, how did that whole love affair start with fashion, especially with all the, the references that you used to have when you used to do the missing shoots in the, in the, in the trail lines with Tebe? How did you uh, meet how did that where you are now? Um, I think growing up in Kimberley was one of the greatest um, blessings in a sense that it was a blank canvas and um, growing up in a small town, I mean, you, you literally, feel, like it just felt like it was always, um, it was always our playground and there were no rules and we didn't have an understanding of exactly what we were doing, but just the only understanding we had was just about a, a, a thing of having fun and and just growing up with parents that were very aesthetically aware and conscious i think that was very important in, in shaping my my creative um my creativity and just my understanding of what beautiful things are and i think fashion just happened to become one of those beautiful things and um growing up like my my both my parents would dress up immaculately and like and, and would not even go anywhere, you know. They never waited for Sunday to kind of look good. And I think that inspired me a lot and that shaped my my creative eye. And I think that's how I fell into kind of this fashion world. And uh, moving on to where you are now, how have you navigated the essence of your roots to, to your signature? Um, for me, I guess, creatively, I always, home is always my campus, you know, I always kind of reference a lot from home, whether it being home as in like Kimberley or South Africa or Africa at large, but I always explore the idea of just belonging and the idea of being at home and kind of unearthing and unpacking on um, all these different, I think, things that represent the feeling of being home. and. And I think that for me, um, in terms of just like, um, in terms of like the work that I create, other people also happen to find home in that. And I think for me, that's what keeps me going. And that's how I kind of am able to move forward. It's because it's this constant journey of just learning and unpacking the idea of home. And how, what have you found that is so 
comforting in 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 particularly your signature and profile that has so like led you on the global market where you've just recently worked with Beyonce. What do you think particularly was you without being South African but yet being South African? Wow, that's a very <laughs> tough question. Um, I think for me, it, it, it's, it's the consistency, I'd say, you know, and the constant exploration of different avenues of home. And, um, and I guess it's something that I, I explore on a daily and whether it's just a, a random Insta story of just traveling um, or a taxi ride in the city or like, I think it's, it's in the everyday moment because I feel like I, I live my art daily, you know, and it's something that I don't have to even think about. And for, I guess, globally, um, that, that has a great appeal because I think globally, a lot of people always want to find a place of belonging, especially like within the diaspora. Um, it's a matter of connecting the dots and, and being able to kind of create a new picture. And I think that's how I would fit into that puzzle, you know. Um, I think I'm one of the little dots that connect so much for, for many people in, in different parts of the world. Has, has big cities and your global travel ever sort of like disturbed your eye in terms of your particular uh, South Africanness? And especially, as I'll call it there, from the big hole, because you come from a, from a small little town that never really gets that much of uh, uh, creative juices. But right now, the big hole is unearthing like amazing aesthetics do you find that the big cities and the big travels have have influenced that or they've uh, inspired that more i think the travels have really brought me closer to home and they've refined my eye and i think it is when i i left like every every trip whenever i leave um i'm more drawn to home because i kind of understand my point of difference in, in the bigger world. So for me, that always um, just brings me closer to home. And, and I think that actually adds so much more value to my understanding of being South African and to my patriarch, patri, okay. <laughs> Patriarchal. <laughs> <laughs> it just makes me feel more proud. And I think it is such an important thing, you know, um, and to, to kind of just quote um, Diane Friedeland, and, and she speaks about the eye having to travel. And I think for every creative, it's so important that your eye um, travels. And that is- yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the eye never rests. Absolutely, absolutely. And I feel like whenever I travel, like I'm able to kind of create new worlds in, into a, that, that I can connect to, 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 to home, you know? And it is, it is through that that I'm able to kind of build new worlds and get a better understanding of the world and how I fit into it. And then moving on to you, Mzogisi, um, can you just take us to, uh, on a bit of a short little trip from how, you, how Imprint started from the diaries? Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for, for, for the opportunity. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting story. So I, I studied as an accountant, become accounting. Um, my final year, I decided to sort of explore because uh, my journey in accounting has, has always been like um, always automatic. And I wanted to see what else I can do. Um, my mom used to sew. So when I decided to, to sort of explore, uh, playing around with fabric has always been a thing that I've, that I've been like sort of exposed to. So I took an opportunity, uh, played around with the fabrics and uh, I was able to create a brand. Uh, at the time it was called Swagger Diaries. So Swagger Diaries was sort of reflective of, of, um, of the, the influences that I had at the time. Uh, varsity student, uh, very much inspired by Kanye West, but um, with a very strong um, African aesthetic. And I think that's what sort of pushed it to, to grow into imprint. Because when a lot of people looked into what I created as Sugar Diaries, it wasn't, there was a, a small disconnect 
like it, it was very the, the the stuff that I was creating and the story that I was telling with the clothes. It was very mature for the name. So um, growth had to happen, and it's something that happened when I was a an emerging creator for the design in Daba in 2015. That's when everything sort of like um, was born and imprint came to life. You sort of like making and making and and strong and which not necessarily Tosa because you are Tosa, but it still has a very um, much more aspect type of flow. How do you it into into the uh, sort of like the signature of imprint? Um, I think one thing that I did when I when I decided to create the brand or when I drew my inspiration, um, I remember my first uh, collection for SA Menzo Week, it was called Our Roots. And with Our Roots, I decided to take an angle which didn't necessarily celebrate the fact that I'm Tosa. I've always been inspired by the story of an African traveler. So for me... Um, the idea that I can create this brand which sort of celebrated the idea of being an African in the modern times, but taking it to the future, because that's what Imprint is about, the, the Afro-futuristic aesthetic. So um, I didn't necessarily want it to be rooted to, to just my Kosa identity, because I felt in a way it was going to... Um, limit how far I can go. But in, in, in each, you can sort of like see uh, the A-lines, which are very much uh, popular in Umpat, which is uh, the Kosa um, traditional attire. So I took, I, I, yeah, I took pieces from my Kosa identity, but I also opened um, the, the, the brand to exploring the, the wider um, meaning of being an African. I started Surface Design, which is textile design. And I think I had this love for fashion, like it was kind of like a language that I would use to, re, you know, to represent myself. And, and so I think in 2015, I came across a brand called Unknown Union. And I think speaking to Jason and my love for the Japanese culture and his love for the Japanese culture. So I think that's when it kind of started, like we started talking about an exhibition that kind of expresses our, Afri our, you know, our African stories and who we are. And so that's where it's, it really started. And we, you know, collaborated on this exhibition, which was different creatives coming together. And actually I just assigned a kimono to each and every one of them. And they all just painted their stories on a kimono. So I think being true to myself and being true to what I believe is authentic to me, I think that's what, you know, I think to answer your question, I think I'm just going to stick to being who I am and actually just telling all these stories, all these authentic stories that represent who I am. And I think, yeah. In culture or, or, or street culture or where or how people live have sort of had um, this beautiful relationship where the one gives to the other and yeah vice versa. Does anyone want to add to that? You, would you like to add to that? So I think for me like I would like to comment on that because I think, you know, based on what's happening now with the pandemic and stuff, and I feel like with the rise of this consciousness that we should be consuming like local fashion or local design, you know, like local goods, I think there's like this major impact that it has on how we consume things and how people consume things, because I think there's this rise of this consciousness with people, that people are buying more local things and actually like, going to a Louis Vuitton or a Zara or an H&M or, you know, like it's, people are consuming local mm. yeah. good. I also wanted to go slightly back to um, the conversation about authenticity. When we kind of chatted before, we, we sort of touched on the, this kind of um, how we find how we find inspiration and how we take from um, these various cultures and how that informs your practice and 
like thinking about your work when you see more, you kind of um, being inspired by the, the Japanese look, um, we, which some can think about um, or start a conversation around appropriation in the sense how we take from, from others and kind of make it our own. And I'd like to hear sort of um, your, your thoughts on that, um, thinking about obviously inspiration versus um, appropriate, appropriation. So I think for me, as long as you acknowledge, you know, where your inspiration comes from, that's not appropriation. So I think I kind of use like the Japanese kimono as like a blank canvas. Mm -hmm. And authenticity, I think, might mean the surface design work that I do because those are the stories that I'm trying to tell, like as an African person. So I think that's what would be authentic to me. Mm -hmm you know, authentic to the work or because it's borrowed, like the Japanese kimono is borrowed and the people that I collaborate with, you know, there's all are African artists. And I think the stories that we tell, the surface design work that we tell, the textures that are on those kimonos, those are authentic African stories. So I think that's what authenticity means to be being true to yourself. Amazing. Um, Mzikisi, I'd like to, to hear from you as well. Um, appropriation for me, um, it's a conversation that um, gets very tricky in the fashion industry. And it's a conversation that um, actually makes sense. It's a conversation that, that we need to have. For me, appropriation um, and, appreci and appreciation um, is two different things. And the moment you actually um, um, are inspired by a certain culture, like for, for, for myself, I usually make the example of me playing around with prints. So a lot of times I can't just um, tap into um, Ghana, take the kente and then present it on the runway and assume that people are going to be clapping their hands and, and celebrating yeah. imprint using um, a culture that is not mine. So it's always important to, to, to sort of connect um, the dots and in connecting the dots, um, it's not just me, like that's that's how I feel. It's not just me saying that it's from Ghana. I feel like it, it goes deeper in me telling um, a story of how it actually connects um, with imprint as a brand and the voice that I have and the story that I want to tell with a certain collection. Um, so I feel like that's, that's also very important. Um, in the same breath, it's also important to realize um, or to acknowledge that um, the conversation of appropriation, um, in a way, uh, it also gets very tricky. Um, with uh, Philippe, uh, uh, when, when, when we started, uh, I spoke about uh, uh, the A-line silhouettes uh, from Umbato, which is... Um, a traditional Kosa um, attire, but we also have um, Amadaki, which is an attire that um, that women wear when they enter into a different stage when they get married. So it, it's a traditional attire um, that's associated with Kosa. But when you go back and actually understand that um, when what that actually means, Amadaki is Charman which is uh, taken from the German culture. So uh, I might present it on the runway and say, this is my Kosa identity. And someone might come through and say, actually, that's a German culture. So it does get tricky in a way, but it, it all goes um, uh, with uh, make it, doing your research, uh, acknowledging when some, where something is coming from and actually connecting it to, to the story that you want to tell. So in a way, I can go to the runway and say, it's Germany, is my culture, and, and tell the story of how it actually came to be part of the Corsa identity or the Corsa story. No, lovely. I think... <laughs> Philippe, is that you? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, can you back and if she can sort of like, I've just heard him so easy had to say, and how um, he just sort of like explained that he explained horrors of oppression, and how that last uh, to be in how it may actually true love and demand in that heart. Philippe, I think we lost you again there. I think hmm. the movement of the microphone is causing some... Um... Okay, I'm going to... Okay. That sounds better. Is it better now? That's better, yes. Okay, Can I'm saying... Go hear me Okay. 
Amanda, is there anything you'd like to add or Trevor? Yeah. Um, I would say, uh, I mean, it's a very important conversation. Yeah. To have. Yeah. 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 Trevor's, Trevor's just, uh, go ahead, Trevor. Go ahead, Trevor. Okay. I think, um, I think we should look at it from a point of view where fashion is a conversation. Um, and it's a constant conversation between... Um, it's a conversation, so I think it, 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 it's an opportunity to learn. So from both ends, um, I think for us as South Africans to learn about our cultures and to be able to appreciate our cultures before we even enter conversations of appropriation. And mm. also to also, as South Africans, be able to harness our cultures and to fully use and explore um, our cultures before they get exploited. Because I think what always happens is that conversations about culture always come up when once uh, the culture is appropriated, as opposed to just having an exploration of culture in a collection or in a, an art piece, um, I think we should not wait for our cultures to be exploited and appropriated for us to actually acknowledge them. You know, I think it is, it is a matter of it being a daily practice for us. And, and I think that in that way, we'll be able to kind of mitigate appropriation. And I think the internet has become such a powerful tool to kind of unpack all of these um, these complex issues about appropriation and um, and and appreciation. And I think, with that said, also um, social media comes with a lot of democracy. You know, because every voice matters. So I think it it allows different voices to kind of um, get a platform. Yeah, no, um, that makes total sense. I mean, when we had a conversation earlier, we also um, explored how important it is to actually educate people, not only on inspiration versus appropriation, but also um, the sort of how the, how the fashion industry actually works and educating people on why it's also important to, to, to support local and to support mm. South African fashion. Um, in that sense. Yeah, I think that, yeah, I I don't know if, but I think that's so interesting because to me now you're getting all, all the sort of um, the layers and the cycles are starting to meld together. And uh, as Trevor says, you know, the um, social media and, you know, internet ac accessibility for the, the season is that, um, we can tell the stories from the source and that's where you're getting these incredible brands, um, you know, like um, La Duma from Matosa and, and Tebe and Rich and all of the, the um, talent that we have and Sindiso and <clears throat> these guys um, are telling incredible stories. Um, and I think that um, even going back to the time where I remember Janet Jackson coming to South Africa and doing a, a beautiful video and, and, and us saying, you know, that that was appropriation in, in, in some ways because it wasn't acknowledging the South African aspects that were portrayed in that video. Um, but here, um, at, in this time and place, I think that it is, is, a, is a beautiful opportunity for things to move together with mutual uh, appreciation, mutual inspiration that's that's honoured and explored and the newness, that's what I'm enjoying, is that there's newness coming from the fusion of all the different parts of the world that we're inspired by. Onisimo is inspired by Japan, you know, so am I, but you know, what's right about that, what's wrong about it, that's the conversations that need to be had mm -hmm. so we can move to the next phase where we know we're using, um, not using, that's the wrong word, we know we're inspired by something, but it has to be done in the in in the right um, in the right spirit um, that it gives the original the original um, craft or person or culture the 
um, the acknowledgement, but it doesn't mean you can't do the fusion in the way that suits your brand DNA. Completely agree with you. Um, just also speaking about the topic of educating, I think that another interesting um, sort of question that comes to mind is how do we create um, more diversity, areas of diversity? And I think that that's also an important, an important topic to speak on and to speak about um, mm. within the fashion industry. Um, the, the conversation of diversity, um, it's a very interesting one for, for me, um, oh, actually looking at it right now, um, when, when I started in the industry, uh, I wanted to create a brand, uh, like I said, that was representative of, of, of who I am, where I come from and the stuff that I wanted to see um, as a fashion lover and as, as a creative. Um, when I was in the industry, I remember showing at SA Men's Week, um, for me, uh, showcasing at a platform um, that was for, for Men's Wear Fashion Week, looking at the men that were sort of uh, portrayed on the runway, it wasn't really representative of the men that I saw in the streets or the men that I went to varsity with. So um, I remember I was one of the few designers um, who actually um, put um, the first uh, um, male um, dressed um, as a female. Uh, on the runway, um, regardless of how he chose to identify. So for me, um, diversity was a very important aspect that I had to, to address uh, from a very early stage. And that's something that sort of like grew as the brand, um, sort of like found um, different ways to communicate. Um, looking at Imprint now uh, as an African luxury brand, um, it, it, it sort of... Um, became automatic that when you when you classify it as a, as a luxury brands, your price points are sort of um, in, a, in a different level that are accessible by a different market. And it, it spoke to, to the conversation that I had with myself when I started that um, if I'm creating this brand, this African luxury brand, uh, this is, that is offering um, these products to, to the people, am I really reaching the people that I wanted to to sort of connect with and communicate with when I started the brand. And that's when I introduced an element of um, the affordable range and then the high end range. And, and for me, that spoke to, to also um, diversity, diversity in, 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 in income um, price or, or different price points. So for me, um, diversity speaks to, to, to a wider um, um, conversation than just um, inclusion of race or, or any of the like um, conversations that are always on, on, on people's, um, yeah. Amanda? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, no, um, I, I think that um, Onisimo also in our previous chats, I think he had something he wanted to say. I really don't want to... Um, um, you know, take over. Yeah. The feel, feel, feel free to jump in at any time, guys. Okay. So I think the question was the question, how do you create diversity in what you do? Yes. Um, I think I'm literally like not the right person to ask this question <laughs> to, but I'll try and answer it from my point of view because I think for me, there was a saying that I kind of came across when I was starting to do, like when I was starting to be a fashion designer, that I would rather be everything from someone for someone than be anything for everyone. So I think it kind of restricted me. Like, so I think what I am doing is like telling personal stories. And I think everyone that sort of relates to those stories is welcome to be a part of the brand and... So essentially what I'm doing is creating like a cult brand. It's like not <laughs> everyone is going to get it because I get a lot of people that are kind of like, you know, what you're doing is like weird shit. And I'm like, okay, thank you. But I yeah. think if it relates to you, then, you know, please, I mean. Yeah. Cons but well, I just think thinking about um, your passion for collaboration, I think that's also in its way creating 
diversity within your own mm. mode of practice because you you work with different people, you you inspired by many different people, and you kind of bring that into your circle and create from from that point. So I don't think you should um, underestimate your <laughs> your 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 part in creating diversity. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Jeff, I think I, I can sense that you you have something to add there. <laughs> um, sure, absolutely. Um, I think diversity is very important in the fashion industry because I think the fashion industry is, is one. I guess even the, the whole creative industry is is a a very discriminatory um, industry. And I think a lot of people have been marginalized for so long and there's been a lot of exclusion. And I think diversity is a conversation that I think it's like there's so much to unpack with diversity and it 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 like almost needs its own panel discussion. And mm. but with that, I think it's something that um that should be addressed. And it it it's not just about having um different um faces, you know, it's about mm. also just having um having a fair amount of decision makers and especially like black people and, and people of color that have been previously mm. disadvantaged and those that have not had a seat at the table and think like the table needs to be extended and um, and those voices need to be heard and not just be seen as faces. Cause I think a lot of the time within fashion, it's that diversity sometimes confused or kind of sugar coated with just black models you know, mm. and that is not diversity. Diversity is, I guess, being able to to have a voice and to have decision makers. And I think if a company within a, a fashion brand has enough diversity, they won't even need a diversity panel or a diversity board, you know, because mm. those kind of areas of exclusion and, um, they can be easily mitigated by just having um, a fair amount of, you know, um, diverse voices at the table. Yeah, that's, that's it from my side. Yeah. yeah, and I think that also leads us back to that question of um, does fashion influence culture or does culture influence fashion? And um, I think that What's been interesting for me over the years is that there are some aspects of the of the choice of shape and and particular garments that have been worn in South Africa for generations that aren't always on trend in other parts of the world. For instance, um, a line maxi skirts, and um, I mean that that's a thing that I know in you know the past when I was dealing with a company called Big Blue that, you know, A-Line maxi skirts were one of their biggest sellers. And if you looked around the world, nobody else was wearing those long skirts. Um, but it's, it's just something that um, I find so interesting when you get into the depth of just the actual elements of um, clothing that are, are iconically South African um, and South African. Um, so, yeah, but I mean, going back to diversity, I think with with South Africa, there are some ways in which it is more diverse because of the um, because of the um, spread of culture, um, as opposed to say a European country or um, you know Britain or England, where where a lot of the cases they the the black black minority, so the um, trajectory from the last 20 years <clears throat> in South Africa has been a good and a fast one and that people are speaking with their feet and with their, their you know, their purchasing. And so the shift to um, interesting, iconically South African garments and looks and color combinations and prints and embracing that is, is more apparent and more visual. I hope that makes some sense. Um, I, Philippe, um, we have about 10 minutes left and I really would want, like to get you engaged in the conversation if, you're, if you're, your mic's working. Oh, 
Okay, still no sound there, but please um, drop your questions in the chat so we can also include your voice in some form. Um, I'd also like to hear from, from the audience if there's any questions that we can open to our panelists um, in this last 10 minutes. Um, there was another question I had for, for, for Trevor, um, just having worked on, obviously, worked with Beyonce, there was a question that we had whether um, we have to sort of alt, alter SA fashion to compete on a, on a global scale. Um, and I think when we, when we chatted previously, um, your feedback was so profound and I, I would like you to kind of um, chat a bit about that as well. Um, how does SA fashion compete on a global scale and do we feel like we need to sort of alter ourselves in order to compete? Um, I think we do not have to alter ourselves because time and time again, South African fashion has proved itself to be an equal and even far superior than, um, mm -hmm. than international brands. You know, I think um, Africa is the source of creativity, you know, and the cradle of, of mankind. And I think everything always starts here and the world is just going back, you know, and I think with even the opportunity to work with Beyonce and her her biggest inspiration was 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 um Africa and South Africa to be more specific, you know. And it it it's so important how how I guess South Africans have to kind of harness their power as an understanding of who they are and not even think about altering, you know, because I think the minute we have to alter ourselves to fit into a, a, a certain um, a certain frame of mind, we kind of lose ourselves, you know. And I think that's what authenticity is about. It's being um, unapologetically yourself. And I think it is it is being yourself without thinking twice. You know, it, it, it's it's such a natural um, such a natural thing. So I think um, it is important for South Africans to continue to to just South African creatives to continue telling their stories and to continue just creating and not even without even thinking about breaking it into a global market or whatever, because I think it will happen, it is happening. So it's just a matter of being consistently you and just keep pushing. Um, there's a few questions from in the chat I see. We have one that asks, how do we keep working? How do you keep working during this pandemic? And I think we'll open that up um, to anyone on the panel that wants to respond. Cool, um, okay. I can go. Oh, go you can go, Amanda. No, you go ahead. Cool, thank you. Um, so for me, um, it was an interesting shift. Um, the pandemic hit uh, at a time where I had just gotten comfortable with um, my new job space um, and also having uh, Cape Town space. So I had this um, commute uh, back and forth, Cape Town and Johannesburg. So when it hit, I was in Cape Town. So it, it sort of like changed um, everything for me. I, I wasn't able to travel to Jobek, meaning that I wasn't able to, to focus on the Jobek shop or to produce or to sell from that side. So it it, it forced um, me to, to work with what I have again. And also it pushed um, or inspired a lot of creativity and, and me to be inventive. Um, it also allowed me to focus on the concept of sustainability, which was something that I, I sort of forgot about or I wasn't um, touching. Um, much on as much as I was supposed to because uh, resources were limited. Not a lot of uh, suppliers were, were able to, to source fabrics from outside. So there was a lot of um, interesting um, creative ways that I, I got us um, sort of um, established um, in ways to work. So it, it's been a, po it, it, it hit negatively, but there were a lot of negative, um, positive, sorry, that sort of like came from it. Mm. Amanda? Yeah, I think for um, myself and, and um, us in the business, it was, you know, a, it was a really severe time of um, kind of assessing and um, looking at the business, um, seeing how we can um, start up again, because in the beginning, you're conscious of not trying to put product and being sensitive to everybody's situation. 
But then as soon as things started to open up, for us it was necessary to begin working again. Um, the, the shift we did is that we've made a lot of masks and they're selling um, well and people appreciate them. Um, and mm. it's a case, you know, it's a lot of mitigation had to go um, um, on budgets, um, re-looking at budgets, um, reassessing what you can put into the store, what you have to hold back, how you can repurpose stuff. And yeah, thanks to my team and, you know, there's um, you know, a lot of work that's been done to make sure that we are at this stage um, ensuring that we have a business for all our staff to um, be able to move forward. You know, it's, it's, it's shift, it was you know, backwards and forwards, but now it's a motivation to, to really be there for everybody who, who works within the brand. Mm -hmm. Eva Onisimo, would you like to add? So I think for me, how I've been working is like, I think when lockdown started, I kind of hit like this creative block where I was actually not able to create anything. Because a lot of our, a lot of what I do is informed by where I am, like the spaces that I see and the people that I actually like, the conversations that I have with people. So I think not being able to meet with those people and having coffees and going to the spaces that inspire me, it kind of, you know, really, it hit me very, very hard. But I think it kind of allowed me to reevaluate my business. And also really considering how I'm using my materials and which materials I'm using. But I think that was sort of like happening like pre-COVID. So I think it's really allowed me to think more of who I am and what I want to say to the world with the work that I do. So, yeah. yeah. Um, um, Eva? I guess for me, it's... I guess it, it, it's quite a challenging time and it, it's a time where I guess you kind of have to innovate and I guess being creative during a time of, um, in time of crisis, I think it, it, it pushes you to, to even be more creative and you need to kind of find, um, find innovative ways to survive and to even get to a point where you can actually think about thriving because I think as creatives we are always motivated by progress and by motivated by moving forward and um, I feel that it, it, it's I always think of it like in in the sense of like how running is like running on a on a on a in a day you know it's hard but it is possible so I think it's just a matter of pushing through and just yeah it, yeah. It's not an easy exercise, but I think it's something that you don't have a choice but to kind of keep innovating and finding creative ways to to still make a living and keep that on. Yeah, that actually makes me think about the, the artwork that was spoken about in the previous conversation by Mary Sipanda, which is titled In the Midst of Chaos, in the Midst of Chaos There's Also Opportunity, which is so perfect for this moment that we're having right now, um, which actually makes me think of my next question, which touches on um, a question that was sent by Amanda Stein. She says that if we had to hold the panel in a year, how do you foresee this conversation changing? So for me, this also ties into, if we think about the pandemic and the moment that we're in right now, what would you also like to see post this pandemic or post the kind of situation that we're experiencing now in South Africa and the world? Well, I mean, I know from my side and um, a business perspective, um, really hope that people will look at what is happening in their own country. And obviously we're speaking um, with South Africa in mind that people will realize that those big box um, mass producers, um, you know, that instead of just always going to them and being exposed to their marketing and walking to their shops first, that, that they would look local and they would appreciate the, garments that are actually being made in South Africa and uh, support the local designers. I think that's a, a shift. I think in the assessing of um, being at home from the pandemic that hopefully people will 
you know, be more considerate about excess um, and, um, and yeah, buy local. Onisimo? Um, so I think for me, it would be this idea of collaboration and also sharing resources because I do foresee a lot of us not having enough money or enough, you know, resources to create whatever we want to create. So I think collaborating with different people, like say, for instance, if someone is a fabric, you know, maker, you know, like you collaborate with that person, you know, you're sort of creating work together that will benefit the both of you. It's sort of like supporting, you know, local businesses, but, you know, I think the collaboration wouldn't necessarily have to be like money, Base, but I think just like share the sharing of resources. And I think just creating as local creatives and local designers and creating work, you know, that's representing our cultures and then telling, you know, our stories. Yeah. Yeah. We have a comment from Philippe, I think it is. Um, you mentioned in closing, I think we're on the right path. We just have to push further. Hashtag, mm -hmm. we're local, look global. Yeah. <laughs> um, on that note, I think what I'm also taking away from the conversation in terms of how we foresee the conversation changing in future or more of the conversation that we should actually be having is more around the education. I think um, the kind of conversation about authenticity is so it can it's so deeply rooted that we could probably spend another two hours just unpacking that on its own but there's some other things in terms of what is authenticity how do you support local how do you shop how do you um collaborate and how do you create all these diversity all the diversity within this kind of um profession is something that i would be interested to see more of mm. Everyone's silent. <laughs> <laughs> everyone's thinking. Everyone's already kind of formulating the the, the idea in their minds for the next conversation. Hmm. Yeah, um, I think I think mine sort of like connects with what uh, Philip said and, and what you've you've just said. Um, for me, it goes with um, the idea of um, I get that we still have to 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 educate. But I feel like we, we, we need to push for a space where people just, um, it's automatic that when it says um, made in, in South Africa or made in Africa, or when it says um, it's a story about Africa, it shouldn't be my, my responsibility as a creator to sort of like um, campaign for you to appreciate it, let alone uh, you buying it. It shouldn't be, it, it should be automatic that as an African, you, you are for African stories, you are for African creators, and you are buying into the idea that um, Africa is this beautiful, um, inclusive continent and our stories connect and we should be all supporting each other, creating with each other, each other and collaborating. It shouldn't be a conversation yet. It shouldn't be a campaign. We should all be working together and supporting each other. Yeah. Um, I also just want to add on top of that, I mean, as much as we would like that to happen, we need to understand also that what is the driving force? Like who takes responsibility to start those conversations? I understand that it's a collective thing and we all need to be doing it, but what can we do in our respective fields to encourage the conversation, mm. to start the conversation, whether it be with um, our circles or educating family and friends or um, kind of how do we start? I think it also comes to to the to the power of um, collaboration. You see what um, Beyonce did. I was actually having that a conversation with uh, with a musician, a South African musician. I was like, um, I create a collection. I put it on the runway. I use your song, and I play and I play your song as a connection to the collection that I've created. It's 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 never a situation where you reach out as a musician to say, 
Mzu, can we create um, um, a, a, a concept uh, involved uh, a, a stylist, uh, photographer, all the creators sort of like collaborate in this beautiful concept. So I, I think uh, the conversation starts with um, individuals, but it's mostly with the creators. Because look at what uh, Beyonce was able to do, like the conversation and the idea, it was easy to sell that to the people because people saw Africa as this beautiful um, concept, as this beautiful idea, because all the creators are together. Um, my boss, uh, Tra Trevor Sturman, um, different designers from Nigeria, they're all under the same umbrella. So it makes it easy for people to buy into that idea. So it, it comes to, 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 to collaboration. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's also us pushing um, as much as possible for quality um, and uh, making sure that we're playing our, um, you know, part in keeping up with always improving and you know if you if you keep um like the the visual the collaboration the quality and the production you know it's it's all it all boils down to business so you know yes aesthetically we can we can talk around circles but it's like doing your best to produce mm. the goods thing mm. yeah, yeah. Do you have any final thoughts from your side? Um, I think moving forward, it, I think it's a matter of absolutely cultivating that culture of collaboration, um, but also cultivating a culture of paying, you know. I think it is very important and, and that is, it, 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 it allows so many more people to do what they, what they love, you know, and that keeps the stories alive. And I think um, with that, I mean, it, it, it is about paying people fairly when you commission them. It is about um, striking fair collaboration deals where mm -hmm. it is not a collaboration where it, it's a relationship of a pilot and a passenger, but it's like mm -hmm. a, a relationship where we are both co-pilots and we are able to kind of teach other this value as equal. And we both understand that we are choosing each other and not, mm -hmm. you know, just because I approached you doesn't mean that you don't have the power to choose me as well, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a it's a matter of 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 learning um, and kind of cultivating that culture of of love and respect. That's beautifully said. Very important. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I don't know if you've seen um, Tiffany. There's um, some. Philippe has said um, we should consciously live in local brands, not wear them just as occasion wear. And then mm -hmm. he said all, stake, stake, um, um, all stakeholders, and I think he's saying within government and business, have to help emerging creatives by setting up structures that are easy to access. Mm. And then there's another question mm -hmm. um, from Lucinda. I'm very curious about the future of production and supply chains and connecting the wealth of skills and labor to smaller and agile businesses, all really valid. Hmm. It boils down to yeah, getting, it, getting the product out there and to the people in mm. an ethical and sustainable way with beautiful stories. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's quite evident that there's um, a lot more work that we need to do and a lot more conversations that we will need to have. Um, but I'm grateful for this platform that we're able to engage in this way and actually just have this conversation and, and share thoughts and thinking with each other. Um, we actually ran slightly over time, but it doesn't seem like anyone <laughs> is complaining. <laughs> um, but on that note, I'd like to thank the panelists for joining us. Teva, Onisimo, Amanda, Nzikizi, you've been great. Um, and I'm hoping that we can engage further. If Philippe is still there, Philippe, thank you for joining us. I know it was difficult with your connection and I'm hoping that we can engage with you again um, and that um, the kind of connectivity will be kinder so we can actually hear your lovely voice. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. And we will be sharing some content um, later on this week um, and we will be sharing this with all the participants. We appreciate your support and thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you. you. Sure.
Yeah, we really appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, Amanda. Bye. Okay. Bye. Okay. <laughs> okay. Nice to see your face, Missy Mo. <laughs> <laughs>